Good afternoon. My name is Ken Anderson. I'm a visiting professor over at the Keller Center and here at the Anthropology Department. I'd like to welcome you to the Keller Center's lectureship series on creative minds and leadership. Today we're going to have uh, Christian Modsberg speak about observation and listening. Which he hasn't told me what it is yet, so we'll see. We'll observe and listen and find out. Uh, for those of you who don't know Christian, he is the founder of Red Associates, which is a consultancy in New York City in Copenhagen. The consultancy specializes in using ethnographic techniques and methods, as well as uh, other social science and uh, philosophy approaches to understanding corporate problems. They've been extremely successful at delivering value in this space. Uh, so not only have uh, they been kind of innovative, but also uh, financially well off. You can tell he has a better tie than I have. Um, I, I first uh, met Christian about uh, 12, 15 years ago. I was starting a conference called Ethnographic Praxis in Industry, where we were trying to bring together those lost souls who were out and outside the academy to come together and try to create something that was a little bit different, where we could develop our own body of literature that would help us succeed and demonstrate value. And uh, he was, we were at Microsoft starting the conference. Christian was there saving the company uh, at the time. But what, what, what was sort of interesting in our, we had a brief meeting in the hall, and, and what he liked was that we were trying to create a literature, create a body of knowledge where one had not existed before. Uh, since that time, uh, Epic has gone one particular path, but Christian has gone his own way and produced a couple of different books that have been quite successful in some circles. One was A Moment of Clarity, which basically outlined how ethnographic practice can uh, bring success to companies. Um, it was registered as uh, one of the 15 uh, most amazing business books in 2014 by Entrepreneur, one of the 10 best books on creative leadership by Forbes, and the best book of the year by Strategy and Business Magazine. So it's not your typical places for uh, some publications, but nonetheless is really pretty amazing. More recently, he had a book called Sense Making that came out, I think, last year. And uh, again, sense making is really about uh, how it's important to understand human behavior, but that in order to do that, you really need a deep understanding of the social and cultural context. And basically, it's a it's a manifesto for how the humanities and social sciences are crucial to business today, more so than ever. And uh, I'm just going to read a quote here from Mark Fields, who is the president and CEO of Ford Motor Company on the book. At Ford, we believe the key to creating products and experiences that truly make people's lives better is to deeply understand the customers. Technology alone isn't enough, so we've changed our product development process to focus on customer experience, not the vehicle. And since making, Christian Madsburg explains with depth and structure how this can be done. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty remarkable thing, and it was a Financial uh, Times book of the month a couple months ago. So with that slightly longer introduction than I intended, I give you Christian Madsburg. Oh, and on behalf of the Keller Center, oh, you. you get books. Thank you. That's good. Thank you. I always thought that I would end up working in a place like this. When I was a kid, I, I, was an, I had asthma and allergy. And when you have asthma and allergy, you don't play so much football outside. You end up reading inside uh, most of the time. So I thought I would end up as faculty member in a university somewhere in Northern Europe. Um, but then I went to university, and I found that was really unpleasant. Um, I found the. Uh, the discussions there uh, rather aggressive, and people seemed unhappy. Um, so I just thought th uh, that's that's probably not for me. Um, and uh, it's also if you c if you live in in a country like Denmark, which is where I'm from, uh, the university there is not Princeton University uh, at the level. People maybe prepare a little less than than people do here. So I th I then uh, thought I would be a writer, and then I went into the media business in the end of. Uh, the 90s, and if you can imagine sort of an, an after the apocalypse kind of feel to, to any industry, it wasn't the place where you'd think you'd get assignments of sort of four or six months and go and really immerse yourself in something. Um, 
So I sort of fell into when I was 22, and I looked like I was 16 or less. Um, I fell into starting a company, and it wasn't really because I wanted to start a company. I didn't have a plan or anything like that. I didn't have what they call a strategy. I've s since learned what they call a strategy. Um, I just fell into it, and I got to do something. Um, I was interested. I studied. Um, German philosophy, particularly phenomenology, um, intensely, and was interested in that. Uh, and I thought, like maybe those tools, however tortured and Germanic and 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 hard to understand they are, they seem rather practical. Um, and I thought that um, that the theories that I've learned about in anthropology classes and 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 in the philosophy I studied, that that seemed rather interesting and I thought the thoughts that we had in the humanities about things like identity, family, travel, mobility, cities, and so on, religion, meaning, were much more advanced than what they had in the companies that I visited. The companies I visited had always chopped humanity into four quadrants, so they would be sort of a two by two matrix where there were the red ones and the blue ones and the yellow ones and so on. And I thought it was so stupid, uh, the kind of things that they, that they uh, seemed to think that um, was a good description of how we lead our lives and what's important to us and so on. So I c managed to convince the mu municipality of Copenhagen to take me on to do a study. And I think about, I looked like a 15-year-old. I, I, I don't understand how I could get the mayor to pay me anything for it. But th at the time, they had an 18% sick leave rate. So people that, 18% of the people that work in the municipality called in sick every day. This is rather high if you think about it. And, and it was particularly in the health area. So people that took care of the elderly, people that worked in hospitals and so on. And they didn't know what to do about it. And the tools that they had were business school tools. So they used new public management, they gave them questionnaires, they asked them things all the time to try to figure out what, what, why is it that all these people are sick all the time. And I then spent, I think, four weeks, which was flamboyant for them to spend four weeks anywhere, just observing and looking at what's going on. And you didn't need four weeks to understand what was going on. It was just basically miserable to work in, in those situations. And it was miserable because of all the administration that was being put on them. So what they really cared about, and since I was interested in Heidegger, care is one of the core concepts in, in, in modern Heidegger's work. What they really cared about, the reason why they came to become a healthcare professional was being undermined by paperwork and surveys and all kinds of stuff. And then I said, why don't we choose a hospital, an elder care home, and try to roll back the amount of administration. And then suddenly the, the rate of people calling in sick fell down to 12%, then down to 9%. And then they implemented it in the entire city. Uh, and now it's still sort of hovering under 10%, which is much better than before. And that insight was sort of the dumbest thing you can imagine, if you think about it. It's not you don't need to be a genius for that, but because nobody's ever gone there and sort of spent some time with a nurse or a patient or a doctor, but sit on in clean rooms looking at spreadsheets really about rates and, and, and um, uh, so on, they, um, they got a new insight. And, that, and when I was 22, I thought like, that that's seems reasonable. And then I convinced Lego, the company in in company the, in the com company in, in Denmark that is doing toys, I think maybe some of you have suffered um, the budgetary consequences of, um, of, of dealing with Legos. Uh, it's an expensive toy, but they were in real trouble at the time, and, and we convinced them that it's not just about selling toys, it's also about how children play, um, which seems, again, like the dumbest thing in the world, but it was sort of an epiphany for them that, it was, you know, you need to think differently about these things. So I, I asked them, uh, could we spend some time with kids? Uh, and they said, well, no, you can't do that. That's illegal, and what would the parents say, and so on. And uh, we said, no, no, we will, we will go. And we went, um, and we looked at kids in, uh, around different places in the US and different places in Germany. And 
um, it, we found something completely mind-boggling to the company. So this is a company that for 10 years lost $300,000 a day. Every day they send a check to $300,000 um, because they basically had the wrong lineup. And the idea was that all the information that they had around toys and around kits came from trend surveys and you know stuff like that, sort of intellectual pollution, really. Um, and that survey data and all that material showed them that kids had shorter attention span and had ADHD, right? which meant that they start designing the products in ways that could be uh, quickly done with. So quite, unsuff quite um, uh, uncomplicated and very simple storylines. And then we found, we went out and we looked at kids, and we found, I found a kid in Germany that I went and, and spent some time with, and he well, had ADHD, and he uh, sp spent hours and hours playing um, imaginary sort of football, um, so sort of fantasy league football type things, with pen and paper for hours. So we thought, like, that's not ADHD, that's not necessarily a short attention span, that seems like something else. And then we went to America and we found this, chi this, this child in, in California that after a while showed us his most valuable possession, which was a shoe that was completely beat up. And it was like, that's not, that doesn't seem like a very valuable possession, but the reason why it was so valuable was that it was worn in all the right ways. So if you do a lot of kickflips on a skateboard, your shoe will look like that. So over and over and over again, we found evidence by just observing and listening to people, sort of being down on our knees, playing with kids, we found that it wasn't true that the, in, the internal assumption that's been driving all development for millions of dollars over time and that led to sort of uh, uh, you know, $300,000 300, of loss every day was based on the wrong assumption. It was based on the wrong idea about why kids play and the wrong assessment of what was going on. And then we thought, maybe we could make a company out of this. Right? Maybe, we could, maybe we could advise not just write books about things or articles about things, but maybe we could use this technique of looking at reality um, uh, and, and sort of make sense of it and use the, a non-dumbed-down version, like actually having time to, to look at, at kids or patients or whatever group we're talking about. And maybe we could even infuse it with theoretical understanding. Like, I was interested in books and theory, and it turned out that the theory was what made the data snap into place when we looked at it. And it was the theory that explained to in the intelligent people in the companies we work for what uh, made sense to the people we looked at. And then we started, you know, we started working um, with starting making TVs and mobile phones and probably some of the phones you have in your pockets I've been involved in, some of the TVs in your home. Uh, we started dealing a lot with medical uh, situations. So how, what, what is, how do you get people into good routines? How do you get people to um, understand the situation that they're in and so on? And instead of sending out surveys that people sit and click behind screens, we would go and spend time with them. And to a corporation, that, it, it, it blows their mind that you can do something like that. Uh, it is um, unpleasant for them to think that you have to go to Western China to study tea when you can just send them a survey instead. Uh, in in Coca-Cola, the Coca-Cola company, they have an idea for this. They call it Outside Nielsen. So Nielsen is the company that makes surveys. And everything that isn't in that bucket is outside Nielsen. That's sort of the rest of the world. And that's where we, we sort of resided for a while. So um, we then led to, we, we're now, um, I checked when I, when I left. Right now we're doing a study uh, on families and cars. So the way the American car industry is designing cars is by um, making two seats in the front and two seats in the back ensuring the father, so the father would sign most likely, on, if you look at it statistically, and, um, and finance it as a nuclear family as we understand it in America. Yet most customers around the world, so in India or Brazil or China or Indonesia, live a different life like that. So the way we design, finance and insure 
is based on a family model that really isn't the norm. So what is it then? And how do we design, finance, and insure vehicles? So that's one thing. Another one is, I don't know if you know this, but in the Midwest, there's this, of course, this big opioid situation that is uh, uh, catastrophic. And what has happened lately, and this is what we study, is that since they have pulled out the medicine from many of these people, people have gone on heroin instead. And that means that we have a heroin addiction and people get HIV because they use each other's syringes. So how do we get that under control and what's, what's going on? Um, or we do, um, we do a study on how uh, small businesses in North America are thinking about uh, how to grow their um, uh, dry cleaner shop or um, restaurant or whatever it is and which kind of tools we could provide for, them, for a big telecom company. So these are all sort of happenstance in a way. It's just applying the kinds of tools you would learn in a place like this to a completely different context. And I just want to th talk a little bit about sort of the, some of the tools we use. And this will provoke the hell out of anybody with a consistent um, academic mindset because what we do is that we use theories that are ontologically in conflict. We are highly pragmatic in terms of figuring out just getting some sort of sense of what makes what makes sense. So we don't have the we don't have the academic goal of purity in thought. What we have is a very pragmatic way of trying to change a company with hundreds of thousands of people and hundreds of millions of dollars of investment in a way that is really a pragmatic dance between the way we think and the way they normally think. Okay? So the first thing is, and this is how I try to describe um, these things to executives. And these are people generally with a background in business or engineering. Um, and they are smart. They often have PhDs. They're smart people at the top of these companies, but they don't know anything about social science. They don't know much about our language, and they're highly skeptical. They think it's something that's very left-wing, and they think it's anti-capitalist in a way, and they feel threatened by the critique. And they should be. They should feel threatened because there are reasons to critique things. Uh, but the way I try to explain things is sort of getting them into a mindset where humans, human beings, also could be an info in a, a data stream rather than just finance and technology. Okay? So the way I normally talk about it is that there are three levels of, of listening or of uh, empathy, which is the word they use for it. It's also the word that Obama used for it. It's sort of a, the natural way of say, saying, how do we turn on our empathy? And I normally say that there's sort of three levels. There's intuitive, So, the, so intuitive empathy is what we do every day. And in, in sort of my Heide, with my Heideggerian background, it's what he calls background practices. So it's the things that we all know how to do every day. So that's, could, that could be how far from each other do we stand, how much do we raise our voice, what's proper and appropriate, and what is it one does in a particular situation, how do you eat with fork and knife, and so on. So very intuitive, where you're not really aware of the situation. So when you see people talk to each other, they adjust the distance that they stand in very naturally, and it's sort of the dance of everyday life. And th that's not what people think about when they think about empathy, but that really is what's going on most of the time. The next one you could call aware. So, so aware, and that's the, that's the one people think about. So that is, you know, he looks a little bit depressed. What, what's going on with him? That sort of level. And that's the highest level they can think of in an engineering uh, organization like the Ford Motor Company. That is going out and being a little bit empathetic with people. And what we're saying is that's not enough. There's something above that, and we call that analytical empathy. And the only difference is, is that it's infused with theory. That you carefully organize, you ca carefully capture, organize, and rework your way through data by means of theory. And when, they, when I say that, they say, ah, that's just, that's just science. I said, no, well, you can call it science if you like. We call it just organized 
conservative relationship to data where data is captured, organized, and thought through in a way where you have the time and the resources to do so. And that seems to be something that people that are not trained in anthropology or not trained in the social sciences get. They say, ah, it's about capturing evidence. And then they say, but, but you're not empirical, are you? I mean, empir empirical data, that's, that's something else. And they say, no, 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 we are the empiricists. You guys have all the answers already. We're the ones going out and actually looking at what's going on. So the economists would come, the people that, have that are trained in economy would say, in, in, in economics, they would say, well, we're the empiricists and, and you guys are sort of fluff or soft people. And we say, no, 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 you are already sure that people act on incentives, are rational, linear, you know, and so on. We don't buy those assumptions from the beginning. We go and we e try to extract as raw an information as possible. And we call that radical empiricism. And when they, from William James, and they get that too. They understand that listening and observation is one step closer to reality than asking people things. And the way they've been doing market research forever and for $40 billion a year around the world is asking people things. And then they see suddenly there's this tool that means that we can get a little closer to reality than having people reflect on their reality. Because we know, of course, that is not very precise. So that's the first thing, that explaining to them that this is, this is about as close to the, the experience people have with some phenomenon, whether that is healing or their relationship to money or their relationship to buying things, uh, the relationship to truth, to learning, and so on, can all be studied as organized and as uh, clean as you would study anything else. And you can extract information out of those situations that we're not doing right now. Okay? So that's, that's what we're trying to do. And then they say, well, that seems like magic to us. And we say, no, 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 that's just what the humanities would do. A historian would do that. An art historian would do something like that. So if you, if you study, say, Winston Churchill as a historian, what you would do is you would find information about his life, his books, his notes, pictures from the time, and so on. You'll try to figure out what did he react against what was, what was it like to be him? That tool is the heart of any liberal arts or humanities education. The tool of putting yourself into somebody else's world by piecing it together. And historians are particularly organized, I think. At least that's my experience. If you want to study uh, Mahler or you want to study uh, Charlie Parker, uh, if you're interested in music, it's also about putting yourself into the time and the space that they were in, and trying to piece together what that world was like. Now that tool is not so different from understanding a young woman buying her first mobile phone in Indonesia, or a family buying, buying a car in Brazil that they need to slip, th slip things around in their, in their life, or trying to figure out what it's like to run a fleet of vans, uh, and so on. It's the same ability to piece together what it might feel like and what, it, what the experience of being them might be like. And that's what we do. We try to say, instead of thinking about how do we sell more cars or how do we sell more phones, then try to figure out what's, the ex what's their experience of life. And that means that the tool sets that, are tr that you train people in here go from being sort of exotic to being at the heart of decision making. So right now what's happening with, in my company, and we're around 100 people now, and we're all people from schools like this with the sort of really smart young people. Um, it, we you com convince them that it's not about how many, how much, how often, but it's about why and how something is experienced. So that's sort of the, that's the baseline. And I just want to give you three examples before I uh, uh, stop of h how we use fairly advanced theory to inform this and these are all sort of theories we would use on a daily basis. Um, the first thing is 
so I, I wrote my thesis on Martin Heidegger, and I've written a couple of books on, on him. And he has, in the beginning of Being in Time, and I, 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 I'm sorry if I repeat anything for you, but he has this idea of a world. Uh, he has the idea that people, humans, human beings, live in worlds. So that would be the academic world, the art world, the, uh, you know, the business world, and so on. And all worlds have a shared structure. They're very different, but there are some similarities in them. So if you are in, if you are in the theater world, say, there would be equipment. And equipment in that world would be um, uh, scenes and actors and tickets and whatever is necessary to have a, you know, um, uh, whatever is necessary to have a theater. Um, and then there will be activities going on you, where human beings are using these pieces of equipment in what he calls in order to change. So you, in his example, you pick up a hammer in order to hit a nail, in order to make a piece of wood fast, in order to build a house, and so on. So chains of activity that has equipment as its sort of components. And it has a goal, which he has, calls for the sake of. So you hit a nail in order to make a piece of wood fast, in order to build a house. So that he calls that for the sake of building a house. And then th in order to build that house, somebody needs to do all that. You need a carpenter to do that. So you have identity involved, right? So you have equipment, activity, or in order to change, you have for the sake ofs, and you have somebody taking up the hammer. Otherwise, it's just a piece of wood with a metal blob at the end, right? And that way, we, can, we use those four components to map out what is the world of diabetes, or what is the world of uh, cars, and so on. And you can see, when you start messing with those worlds, when you start rethinking those worlds, what would that world look like? So let's say, in the auto world, which is something that we're talking about a lot, let's say that we change the way people buy cars, from buying a car to um, renting a portfolio of cars. Right? So if you live in this part of town, in this part of the world, you might sometimes need a truck, and sometimes you might need a faster car, something, sometimes you need to move a lot of people, and so on. So instead of paying $300 a month or $500 a month for, uh, for a car loan, we could give you a subscription to a range of cars. And what does that world then look like? What are the pieces of equipment, the in order to chains, the goals that people might have, and hence, which kind of portfolio and how many cars will we need to service that? So a highly abstract idea like worldhood in Martin Heidegger, which is something that I think he's turning in his grave that we're using it this way, but, but the, the, the description of worlds can be used to figure out how to organize an automotive company portfolio. Right? Okay, that's the first idea. The second one is discourse analysis that of course is used in places like this all the time. But we use it again where if you have an engineering culture or an economist culture, they think that words are connected for everybody. The, the, the signifier and the signified in a word, like, I don't know, the word sheep and the shape of a sheep or the animal sheep are connected directly. But that's of course not the case. Those are constantly debated, constantly in flux. So what we do is we map out uh, which kind of words people are using for something and which way the company are using these words. So I'll give you an example. This is just an abstract example. But the word freedom, if you come from Denmark, the word freedom is connected to other things than if you are coming from, you know, it, the, the Danish, where, where I'm from, the Danish are um, uh, social, it's a social democratic country. So freedom is connected to uh, free education, free health, um, uh, a big public sector, and hence high taxation. Right? So we would map out, if we were studying what does the word freedom mean, we would map out taxation, public sector, free education, and so on, in order to see what, is it, what are the other words that, make, that gives this 
um, empty signifier its content. Now, if you go to um, if you go to a conservative culture in uh, North America, the word freedom would mean something else, right? It would mean it would mean uh, probably small public sector, no taxation. I don't know guns or something. I don't know whatever it will be, but but it, the, the, it would have a very different meaning, and the same word would mean completely different things for th for people. So what we do is that we look at the way that that discourse is form is created inside a company, and how it's created uh, by its customers. And as you might imagine, it's very different, right? The a company would think that their products are absolutely important and vital to anybody's life. And when we go out and look at people's life, we can see not so much. Uh, they would think that, uh, you know, in Ford, they think that every feature that they cram into our cars are absolutely necessary. And it turns out that 20% of them are in use at all, right? Uh, they think that a lot of the marketing material they're doing are helpful, and it turns out, no, nobody cares, and so on. So you can basically use this sort of mapping of the assumptions of something inside of a company and the reality outside of the company by, and, and you can use that to reduce uh, what is made, so reduce cost, take out technology, take out marketing, reduce what's done, um, or you can use it to figure out the kinds of needs people have that we're not delivering on and that our language, by looking at the language and the way people talk about it, comes to the surface. So these are sort of examples of quite theoretical frameworks, but that can be used on something as practical as cars or phones or toothbrushes or anything like that. And um, I think the reason why our company is helpful sometimes and, and I think successful is because we try not to dumb it down. We try not to do a quick, short, cheap version of something, but try to do something real. Um, and we try to sit, tell our, the people that, that want to work for us that we're not interested in shallow anthropology. We're not interested in people that have sort of half studied something. Um, we're interested in people that go really deep in their area. So if you are an English major, we hope you've studied English. And if you are a, an anthropology major, we hope you've really done your anthropology. Um, because it's, th it's through the engagement with art or music or people that you learn this skill of putting yourself into other people's world. And for me, that is a skill of listening that's rather, listening and observation sounds passive in a way, right? It's sort of, but it really is one of the most um, aggressive things you can do in these companies because it's done so little. Everybody seems to be talking and making things all the time. They call themselves sayers and doers rather than observers and listeners. So that's really what I wanted to say. Thank you. you wait, wait, wait. You cannot, as a new person here, I can tell you, you cannot give out homework. Ah, <laughs> I, I wanted to bring you. I, I'm, I'm teaching a course next year uh, at the new school where we are um, reading g great observers in, the, in, in literature. So great writers and the way they've observed. And I brought you my favorite piece, which is uh, J.A. Baker. It's a rather unknown writer that wrote a book called The Peregrine. Um, that I can, it's been my re biggest reading experience the last five years. And this is his description of what good observation is. And I just wanted to bring it because I think it's deeply poetic and beautiful. Um, and um, you, should, you should, if you have time one day, it's a little 100-page book uh, about a guy that observes peregrines in the wild. And the quality of observation and the quality of writing is just, uh, you know, off the charts. It's really lovely. So I, I just brought it because I thought that that, that would that's the best sort of a description of great observation that I've seen. Um, yeah? I would invite you to take a, a look at the, very, the world of all kinds of the very business uh, that, that you deal with. I, I think you're absolutely right that what most firms need is a CRO, that is a chief reality officer. Right. And uh, they don't have them. Absolutely. Sadly. I agree. But uh, look, at the, look at the world of business. 
Business, the blessed sacrament business is money. Right. It is a number, it is a thing. <coughs> and we have been taught diligently that science has, the, has all the answers. I, right. I know this because I have many teachers tell me that right. exactly. And so Natural you science. ask them, uh, right. well, you know, my teachers could never be wrong, right. but my government. But it's, um, the whole deal is that, they're, that you, you, you said they, they're seeking why, how many, the numbers. Yeah. They deal in numbers all day. Right. They're looking for numeric solutions. Right. It's not a particularly odd thing no. uh, that they want to do that, that they go on that track. I believe that you're saying it's, it's wrong. But uh, so my question is, all these people who have done all this mindset and built up a mythos, right. give me an example of how you did change their mind personally. I think by changing the numbers, so showing them, so I did, you know, um, I'll give you an example. We did the first, the first TV I ever did with Samsung. They said, the whole, in, well, the entire language around TVs was that this is a piece of consumer electronics. It looks like consumer electronics. It's sold like consumer electronics. It has a lot of stickers in the bottom that shows how many and how much. And we then s looked at families and, and how people want to live. And it turned out that the people, first of all, they thought that the father or the man in a family were the ones buying the TV. It turned out that they thought so too, but uh, they weren't the ones making decisions about which one. It was the women that did that. And we found that women were not buying electronics, they were buying furniture. So they were buying something that would fit into the room and so on. And this was just on average uh, by looking at four or five countries. And then we said, why don't we try to design a TV as furniture? We would use furniture material, we would sell it as furniture, we would make, it some, make a TV that would not last the 3.6 years that is average for a TV, but more than that. And we made, it, uh, we made it with brushed steel, we made it with piano lacquer and so on. And it's the best selling TV um, ever. It's called Bodo Plus and you can, you can still buy it. And that changed the minds of engineers, uh, that they could see Jesus, these guys sell more TVs than we do. So it, it's been a, an uphill battle, and it's been a very, it's, it's quite, I, I live in, in, um, in, in highly hostile environments, uh, where the, the, my way of looking at the world and looking at people is not the way they think about things. And particularly the last five years with AI and, 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 um, and what they call big data, um, uh, they have this idea that if you just amass enough data, truth will somehow fall out of it by itself. And I, you know, that's not my view. So there's been a lot of confrontation. And, and um, uh, the only way we have known, we have found, the only way we've found to convince them is by showing them. So quite often we, f we figure out something, we understand what's, what's going on, and we test against what they have and see which one works. And, and, and reality, often is helpful. Um, and an understanding of reality is quite often helpful. Yeah. Uh, so I'm one of these unhappy, aggressive academics. Right. So let me take up that role. Right. So, uh, so uh, as an anthropologist also. So I have no doubt what you say can be effective in producing the information you, you claim. Mm -hmm. So my question is about um, what, where Heidegger would roll in his grave, the, the instrumental use of this, like mm -hmm. what, because anthropology actually always found out things that had no use. For instance, they found out Eskimos have 10 words for snow, mm -hmm. or they found out things that these people expect the ghost is gonna come in the room any minute, and why is that? Mm -hmm. So, and based on that kind of pursuit mm -hmm. of knowledge that didn't have an immediate use, they discovered this method that now you want to take and make it into oh, have, an instrument. Have taken, have taken. Or you do take. For decades. And, right, and you yeah. make it into an instrument where you extract the knowledge for, say, business ends. Right. But that is precisely what Heidegger and the, and the Frankfurt School would say, this is the great danger to the world, is that all the knowledge we have is used to control us. It's used simply to study our behavior, extract what's useful, and then feed that back so that we become better consumers of autos or something. So how do you, I mean, I find it disturbing that that would, say, become anthropology departments, that we would precisely only pursue those kinds of knowledges that yeah. would be useful. Right. I think the word only is 
is what, the only place I disagree. I think um, being a voice inside of a highly technocratic place like Facebook, say, that cares about what, how people are experiencing things rather than just having one way of looking at things is a, um, is a, is a worthy endeavor. That's the first thing. The second thing is, because there's engineering, doesn't mean there can't be physics and chemistry. Highly theoretical, I mean, talk about theoretical. Um, n no direction, no utility, just understand what's going on in the universe. Just trying to test what, what, you know, the Higgs particle or something like that. That's not what I, I'm not saying that that should go away. I'm saying that we can't all be tenured professors. Uh, and some of us will have to go out, and I was one of them, and use the skills we have in the world in a way where we can make a living. And um, that doesn't mean that the tenured professor should go away. We need theoretical physics, but we also need to build bridges and roads and so on, which is engineering. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, what, what engineering is to physics, blank is to the humanities. In a way, right? And I think we need to develop that in order to have a seat at the table, to have a voice inside of the places that are really making things for us. And I know Heidegger would say, well, we're all being optimized and we are Gestell and we, are, we will be um, optimized, optimizable resources in the end, right? And I think that's a constant struggle we have inside of the company saying, when, it, when are we doing that just to sell shit? And when are we trying to um, understand the life people lead as patients or nurses or something and trying to make that life either less painful or maybe even better. So I think it's a very, I mean, it's a pragmatic approach, but as somebody that comes, I, I mean, I had a, my child, in my childhood, I came from a very left-wing family and shouting outside at the, at the corporations felt um, unhelpful to me. Uh, and I would rather pursue the same agenda, but inside. And that means that I have to wear clothes I wear and so on, um, and iron a shirt in the morning and, and that kind of thing. But I think I have significant impact on giant institutions by offering a different perspective on what it means to be human that is necessary. So, you know, can you criticize that? Absolutely. Um, will I end up in my, you know, when I'm, retired and say, oh, I shouldn't have done that at all. I don't know. But uh, I think it's an earnest try, and I think it's a worthy, worthy, um, worthy piece of work. Um, at least that's, that's my perspective on it. Does that make sense? So I, I don't want to wipe out uh, 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 the pursuit of knowledge for knowledge's sake. Uh, I don't want to wipe out um, um, any of that. I just think that we right now, I don't know how many opening, openings there are for tenured professors in North America the next two years, but it's not above 100. Um, and you produce a lot of candidates and we need a job market for them. And this could be one way. And I think it's better if you have your students at the table than if you don't. Um, that's at least my, my perspective. Yeah. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, I guess a little bit related to John's question um, and how um, these sort of, in some sense, intrinsically instrumentalizing um, mm -hmm. logics kind of dovetail with um, how you think about empathy mm -hmm. and maybe if uh, the way you're thinking about empathy comes from a particular philosophical tradition, mm -hmm. I'm really curious about this um, as well. And can empathy be lodged um, in the same conversation with these sort of instrumentalizing modes. Mm -hmm. um, I read about, in part, um, the military, the American military's use of, um, of empathy, um, which is uh, a, a different space than this corporate space, but, but it's also very it's much close about, though. Right, so it's about extraction of information. Absolutely. And, mm -hmm. and alongside of it, it there's sort of this um, logic of cultivating rapport and kind of a mimetic logic also, how do you mirror your interlocutors? Right. And that's something that is very close to us as anthropologists, but it is used in a very different way right. in the military space, and I, I know much less about it. 
Right. Well, the military are very interested in us, um, and we've had to not touch it because it felt wrong. Um, we didn't really have a rational reason, or we didn't really, but it felt it felt uh, strange. Um, I know that a lot of anthropologists are working worked in Iraq, uh, and the whole sort of turnaround of the strategy in Iraq was based on. You know, we gotta understand these people's religion, and you know, we're just messing up all the time, and we don't really understand why. Maybe there are cultural reasons for this, and it can be it can be used for the most sinister, most brutal things, really. Um, and I think it's it you need an, an inherent ethical fiber in the practice of it, that, and without that, it can be used for anything. Um, the question here is, I mean, we got a call from. Um, from uh, Facebook not long ago, where they said we have a trouble, we have a problem with our algorithms sorting out the kind of information we're sending out to people, and that has had con consequences for the political system in North America. How do we s understand what's going on? How do we understand what creates truth in the in the experience of people? How do people experience truth, and what's our role in that? Is that worthy of exploration? I think so. Can it be instrumentalized? Absolutely, right? So you just have to sort of deal with that. With you're, you're dealing with giant, very powerful institutions, and when you give them information, they are going to use it for things that might not be your cup of tea. And, and that's a balance that you have to strike every day. And do you think the empathy piece, I mean, do you think that in instrumentalizing sort of logic and empathy itself, how do they coexist for you philosophically how do you think about that, I guess? Where does it come from, your Right, I think, I mean, I think humans are complex beings, and I think we can, I can have both a very instrumental view of something and a very empathetic view of something, and I can switch between them, even. Um, I think, in my company, if we did something that was against the grain of what people believe in, we would lose our people, and that would be devastating for the company. So, so we are in a constant check with the values of the people, and they criticize me every day. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's terror, it's terrorism. But um, I mean, it's really tough to deal with, like, they're just against everything all the time. Um, and we have these debates. Is it better to do a development project in Kenya or working for a Vegas slot machine company? It's some, not obvious, right? There are people that would argue that the development work that's been happening in Africa has been devastating for <laughs> the economies and the people there, and the identities of people there and the, so on. And there are people that say people that go to Vegas just have a good time and who cares, right? And there are people that would argue the other way around, which would not probably be the more intuitive way of arguing. But I think having that conversation is necessary at every single project that you, that you run, and that's the only way we can do it is to say, is this reasonable or not? And we've been fortunate enough to have too much demand, so we have been able to s say, no thank you, we, we're not interested. I the problem is if you don't have enough demand and you actually need to pay the mortgage, that's when you get really problematic ethic, ethics sort of going on. So I, I think we can live within sort of a tension between instrumentalization and empathy, uh, and it's a matter of balancing it in, in an intelligent, way. Um, do we get it right? Do we fall on the right side of the fence all the time? I'm not sure. But we try. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to thank you also for um, your choice of breathing, because I agree with you. Yeah, yeah it's just a... And if I had been <coughs> raised as an ornithologist, it would have been a gold, gold standard. Um, but I was trained as an anthropologist, and I went um, to a different university where the, uh, you know, we, we were sent in huts, and the degree to which you came back with tales of eating human flesh or something of that sort of rigorous nature was really the, the gold standard that we were, we internalized. So my first question has to do with, I would, you know, what do you, what would you recommend as, what would you, what would you name as an ethnography that you um, admire? that involves a field site, if you will, where people are talking back to you. Because, I mean, I, you know, I, have, I, I spent three years in a small village where <laughs> they weren't soaring around quietly. You know, I was constantly having to 
parse the symbolic nature of social action from what people right. said they were doing, from what after Absolutely. years and years and years of sitting there, I figured out what they were doing, and whether you have texts you'd like to turn to yeah. the more ethnographic tradition. Oh, many, many. I mean, the latest one I read was a study on uh, trafficked women from Romania to Italy. And it's, she's, she's at Stanford. Uh, and she went uh, for uh, two years to follow the routes of trafficked women. And there's a lot of credit card scandal, like credit card fraud and all kinds of other stuff going on. But basically following the people that are, sh are, are trafficking the women, the women themselves, and how um, it's not always obvious um, who does what to whom um, and who wants to go and who doesn't want to go and, and the dynamic, like sort of her passing out her own experience with this but also what's going on in the field. And her big trouble was that of course the, the, the police from Italy and Germany and others were highly interested in her information and how she sort of tried to protect the people that she studied, while all this rather illegal and 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 and, and f you know physically uh, problem you know all kinds of things were going on, uh, how how she sort of tried to figure out when should I protect them, should I you know and so on, and I think uh, what she 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 doesn't come down on a side for the police against the traffickers or for the tra you know anything like that. She's just she's got this description of what's going on by spending enough time in there to understand the dynamics and why they're doing it and so on. I thought that was both raw and brutal, but also quite beautiful. Like there's a lot of humanity even in the worst place in the world you can imagine finding yourself. So I really like that piece. Um, but there are many pieces that, that I enjoy. That piece is interesting because he hates people. Uh, so he finds people to pollute the birds through pesticides and so on. And he sees us as just bringing death to any natural setting. Um, and he see, he, he's the poet of the skies, really. Uh, he likes things that fly rather than things that stay on the ground. So the, in that sense, it's different from anthropology, because anthropologists often like people and engaging with people and so on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I would like to learn more about this analytical tool. Right. I'm enjoying you know, these concepts. And uh, regarding these tools, like applying AI and uh, like uh, creating some kind of uh, collecting the data and training and coming up with the solution and what's going on in you know, society, applying this tool, for instance, big companies, sometimes they lie. Oh, yeah. You know, sometimes. How they lie, for instance, Board of director working for 17 years, and suddenly you know the company going down mm -hmm. and lying. They're gonna have new direction. Right. And applying this analytical tool, for instance, in operating system, we have a principle of locality. Well, it says that the things events happen in past indicative of what's gonna happen mm -hmm. in near future. Right. So one of the good things that you know Princeton University with this innovation club killer center connecting to the community right. is a good things happen. Yeah. Now my question is that how can we scale up this analytical tool and uh, uh, yeah. educate publics for instance what's going on it's a big lies right now right. even in election. Right. Somebody committed some kind of wrong things. Yeah. They try to use religion, or the company Absolutely. they did many years wrong. Now they say we came up with a new direction. They are lying. Right. How can we scale, right. scale up this? Uh, well, um, I mean, spoken like a true engineer, it sounds. But um, the the it wouldn't be the first time that religion has been used in politics. I imagine it's been used before, but. But I think um, in, the, in the technology companies like Google and Facebook right now, they're discovering context. They're discovering that he, the context of an activity or, an, or somebody saying something is important to the meaning of that thing. And they're trying to figure out how do we 
scale that how do we piece together worlds really so that we have a higher likelihood of understanding what the data that we have means. And there's been this idea, it, you know, I, I, in the philosophical history it, tradition it's called naive inductivism. The idea that if we just amass or gather enough data, then we don't need the process of thinking through, we don't need theory, we don't need hypotheses, we don't need any of that. We just need enough data and then algorithms would sort of fix it for us. And I think the, the, the pendulum has been swinging that direction for a while, but it's coming back. So even the, even the most advanced machine learning and AI companies in the world are realizing that they, there's a human component that's nonlinear, contextual, historical, and so on. And they try to figure out how do we, how do we use that to, be, to make sense out of the massive amounts of data we have. And I think that's, a good, that's good news for people from, from uh, with an anthropological background and so on, because there will be jobs to do such a thing. And I think until now, I haven't seen anybody but people that can make sense of people. Um, and machines can't make sense of people in the same way that people can make sense of people, because they don't have the context and the background practices and so on. Um, so that's really, that's really it, that, that you would need, you would always need um, people to analyze the data that you can then scale. And that you can do. And that's happening right now.